I'm Tim Ventura, and we're joined today by Wayne Phelps, a retired Marine Corps Lieutenant Colonel and author of On Killing Remotely, The Psychology of Killing with Drones. During his military career, Wayne deployed five times, including two deployments to Afghanistan and two deployments to Iraq. He was amongst the first conventional troops on the ground in Pakistan after 9-11. He also participated in the initial invasion in Iraq in 2003 and the troop surge into Afghanistan in 2010. He commanded units at every level, from platoon to squadron, served as an instructor at the Marine Corps Premier Aviation Training Squadron, and as staff officer in the Pentagon. In 2014, Wayne was selected to become an RPA pilot, and he attended the Air Force undergraduate pilot training, becoming the first Marine honor graduate. His last assignment was as the commanding officer of the Marine Unmanned Aerial Vehicle Squadron 3 in Kanoa Bay, Hawaii. As the commanding officer, he deployed four remotely piloted aircraft detachments to conduct counterterrorism operations against violent extremist organizations. Wayne joins us today to discuss the continuing evolution of drones in modern warfare. So, Wayne, welcome back. It is an honor to have you with me. And let me thank you so much for your incredible career of service as well. Well, thank you, Tim. It's a pleasure to be back with you again. Uh, so the the topics that you touched on in the book on killing remotely, and I'm going to put links into that in the show description, these are becoming even more relevant as current headlines unfold. I mean, the last year has just been insane in terms of drone warfare. So I want to start out with a little bit of background for our audience and ask what inspired you to write the book and what kind of feedback have you been getting from readers so far? Yeah, so I was coming to the end of my career in uh, 2018, and I was going through a transition seminar. And someone asked me, you know, if you could do anything for the rest of your life, what would it be? You know, money is no obstacle. And I said, well, I would really love to, uh, you know, to be an author. Uh, and they said, okay, well, how would you do it? And I, I didn't have an answer to that. So I, I thought about, uh, you know, what do, what do people write about? Uh, oftentimes, people write about what they know, uh, and I had been working in the uh, the drone field for approximately ten years at that point. So, I started uh, investigating you know, what would be a good topic to cover. What's uh, what's a gap in our knowledge on this subject? And I had also sent, as you mentioned, I'd sent four detachments off to fight uh, violent extremist organizations. So I was wondering, you know, what what kind of responses are these you know, individuals having that are using these uh, you know these unmanned platforms to fight with so that's uh, that's what spawned the idea of doing uh, a book on how you know humans respond to killing from a remote distance uh, through drones mm. well and i think it's an incredibly valuable and amazingly timely topic as well. So in terms of American technology, uh, is the General Dynamics MQ-9 Reaper considered the advent of this kind of weapon? And the reason I ask is, you know, when I thought about it, it seems similar in many ways to those older Tomahawk cruise missiles. So I'm, I'm wondering, I mean, is there a way for us to set kind of a firm start to this technology from an American perspective, or has it really just kind of evolved in this direction over time? Yeah, it's it's been more of an evolution. So it's probably a, a little known fact, but the first powered aircraft flight we all think happened at Kitty Hawk with the Wright brothers, right? But it actually happened in 1898 uh, with a, a gentleman named Samuel Langley, and he flew what he called Aerodrome Number no. Five at the time. Um, he flew it right outside of of DC. And it flew for almost a mile. So that was the first known powered flight. And there was nobody on board. It was an unmanned aircraft. So I like to say that unmanned aircraft preceded manned aviation uh, in flight. And then we spent the next, you know, 100, 200 years trying to catch up. <laughs> um, but I would say that it, it has been an evolution. You've seen unmanned systems in World War One, and World War Two, and, and Vietnam. Um, They've really kind of come into their own though uh, since 2000, uh, since the you know, MQ-1 Predator uh, joined the fight and since we started arming it with Hellfire missiles. 
And then when you look at uh, Operation Iraqi Freedom in, in, uh, in Iraq and Operation Enduring Freedom in Afghanistan, we just had this uh, insatiable appetite in headquarters and uh, operations centers for full motion video being streamed back to these headquarters. You know, commanders really wanted to see what was going on on the battlefield. So whether the, the drone was armed or not, uh, we had this requirement for lots of, uh, of unmanned systems on the battlefield. And you, you really saw a spike in the, the proliferation of, of drones in the last uh, 20 years. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, the big change since our last interview last fall has been the widespread use of drones in the Ukraine war. That's something that has just come to the forefront. And it's it's been so rapid. It's just you know surprising and amazing. Both sides have launched hundreds of kamikaze drone attacks with relatively inexpensive loitering munitions. And I think one of the other things that makes this really unique, especially from the Ukrainian side, is there is so much video of this going up online. So not only are there lots and lots of these drone attacks happening, but a good portion of those are seen as they happen. You know, it's it's not real time, but they're going up. You can actually see what happens when it drops the, the you know, explosives. Um, so I'm wondering if this proves the utility and cost effectiveness of these drones in modern warcraft. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think what we're seeing play out in the, uh, the Ukraine conflict is is just the beginning of, of what we're going to see uh, warfare look like, uh, particularly with small unmanned systems that are affordable or uh, tritable almost. Um, you know, they're losing. Uh, you know, 10,000 of these a month uh, from one recent report that said uh, how many drones were being shot down over Ukraine. Uh, but they're, you know, they cost $500 to $1,000. I mean, they're, they're really inexpensive, but the capability of them is significantly increased to the point where you can, uh, you can fly these, uh, these drones and drop a, a small munition with, you know, pretty good precision on a target. Uh, so we're, we're starting to see uh, really these things proliferate, uh, the small drones particularly. And then when you include things like autonomy, uh, the kamikaze drones you're talking about, loitering munitions, uh, we're, we're starting to see these, you know, the, the importance of these on the battlefield. And then I think if we're not watching this conflict, we should be because it's really defining what the future of conflicts are going to look like. It's it's interesting also to see uh, the differentiation in drones, right? Like again, the 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 Predator and the Reaper drone, right? And the Predator is the surveillance model, and the Reaper is the armed model. Those are like small aircraft, small unmanned aircraft. Um, the Russian drones seem like maybe ultralight class. They're they're a little bit smaller than that. Um, I've actually seen stacks of those that look like ammunition magazines as well, where one will fly off and the next one slides down, you know, very, very mechanical, very mechanistic. And then the Ukrainian models um, look more like RC aircraft, to be honest. And I believe that they're also using some forms of gyrocopters, you know, and, and pro probably anything that they can get that flies that can carry things at this point. But uh, so it's interesting to see this diversity of them. Um, wh what do you see as the evolution of that? Do you think it's going to end up being just like dozens, maybe hundreds of different types? Or do you think they'll end up kind of, do you think that they'll end up being kind of a standard for this? I think we'll continue to see um, more and more uh, differentiators. Uh, I, I don't think that they will uh converge into just you know one one type of unmanned system i think they each serve their own purpose like the the small uas uh that are very you know very inexpensive they serve a purpose for frontline troops uh, being able to see over the next ridge line being able to find you know enemy troops locate them calling for artillery um but then you're you're still going to have a place for your larger more exquisite platforms like the reaper or the, you know the the Bayraktar you know TB two uh, that can launch um, uh, ordnance and missiles and you know things like that. There's there's still going to be a place for those. Uh, I think 
what you'll see is just an entire spectrum uh, of unmanned systems, uh, ranging from what we have, you know, the small UAS to medium size to, to larger size. Uh, but what you'll see is some of those capabilities that are only inherent in the larger platforms being pushed down uh, to some of the smaller platforms as well. Ah, okay. And, and one of the other things that seems like it's changing is Iran is taking a more active role with Russia. And so they have been, I believe they're still maintaining a, a quote unquote politically neutral stance on this. But I understand that they're actually helping Russia build a, a factory for drones based on their technology east of Moscow. Um, and that would make sense because when I was doing research into drone attacks, at least from the numbers I saw online, it looks like they have slowed a little bit. So my my takeaway, I could be mistaken, was that uh, the Russians are maybe exhausting their uh, their inventory, right? And so this is a way for them to kind of replenish that. Uh, do, you, do you know anything about that situation? Yeah, I mean, there was a theory that they had exhausted their inventory, and that's why they uh, they reached out to Iran to, uh, to supply drones uh, in the first place. Uh, and the kind of drones that they're they're providing for them are not, um, you know, they're not uh, high end, right? They're they're uh, kamikaze drones. They're kind of one way missions. Uh, they're fairly low technology, um, but when produced and you know at scale and employed at scale, you see the kind of attacks that Russia has been, uh, you know, conducting over the last few months, where you have. You know, barrages of these you know kamikaze drones um the ukrainians have been shooting down you know 85 90 percent of them uh for the most part but uh really all it takes is a few to get through the air defense systems for them to achieve uh, some sort of success um, but I, I would say that you know it, iran is is not neutral on this i mean that's that's pretty uh, it's pretty obvious and uh, the the things that they have been providing and supplying to to Russia, um, you know, they're about as neutral in this as as the United States, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting. You mentioned about eighty five percent of the drones never reach their intended target. I've I've read that as well, and a lot of that is due to just improvements in air defenses. Um, I've also read about improvements in electronic jamming and countermeasures that are playing a role, and. I'm almost wondering if um, that could be a temporary weakness and if that's going to drive the rapid evolution and hardening of these drones as well, right? Like as they see more and more use in combat, all of these weaknesses kind of come to the forefront. And, you know, the upside is that we're, you know, or the Ukrainians, everyone is able to stop these more effectively today. But in tomorrow's world, in the next conflict, uh, I'm worried that that will just help harden and refine these designs, right? So they will be more difficult to detect, more difficult to stop, impossible to jam. Yeah, if you know, it's it's a trade-off. So there's a cost factor, right? You're not going to spend the money on um, a kamikaze drone to uh, to harden it from electronic, you know, warfare, uh, because then it becomes almost too expensive to employ in the manner which it was designed, right? So, so the benefit of having kamikaze drones is that you can, uh, you can launch a bunch of them and you hope some of them get through. But if you start to shield them uh, through some sort of Faraday cage or something like that to protect them against uh, you know, electronic warfare, then you know, it starts to become a little bit too expensive to actually employ them as a kamikaze drone. Um, now I would say that uh, electronic warfare is, is a, great countermeasure um, but only if you're using uh, you know radio frequency to control the drone right so if if you're interrupting that control link uh, typically the drone will do something uh, return to home or it'll be confused and it'll uh, you know potentially crash uh, another way to counter that in the future is you make it more autonomous so it flies you know either a GPS flight flight path, uh, straight to a target, or it uses some sort of you know optical sensing for navigation uh, based off of um, almost like computer vision. So if you could have a you know a, a map of the point you launch it to the to the target, then it could use uh, what it's sensing uh, to navigate all the way to the target, and it wouldn't need any sort of you know 
radio frequency signal for for command and control. Uh, so therefore, you could you could defeat electronic warfare by simply taking away uh, how it's successful. Uh, and that actually brings us to our next point. Um, so from the United States perspective, we have several programs involved with this. One of them that I'm familiar with is the Loyal Wingman Program. And to me, this just seems like a brilliant idea. It's basically a military drone with an onboard AI control system and the capability to carry and deliver a significant military weapons load. So it seems, when I when I first heard about this, it seemed to me like a transitional system where you do have AI, you do have automation, but a human remains in control, and the drone is really a way to extend human capabilities, right? By, by flying alongside of your traditional fighter or perhaps flying alongside of a lead drone. Um, do you think that's kind of where things are going in the short term for the U.S.? Absolutely. Uh, and they refer to it as uh, manned, unmanned teaming or mum tea, if you will. Um, and it, it really takes the, the best of both systems, uh, a manned system and an unmanned system and combines them, right? So you, you still have the human in the, in the loop, you still have human judgment, uh, but you also have the ability to employ an unmanned system uh, in, in some of those situations where it could be too dangerous to risk a, you know, a manned uh, platform, such as uh, early stages of a conflict where there's a high you know, air defense threat and you want to um, try to take out the enemy's air defense, so you could send in some unmanned systems to do it uh, without risking uh, you know, you know, pilots and, uh, you know, in the cockpit. Um, and then you think about all of the, the sensing capabilities and uh, defense capabilities that these unmanned systems could could use in order to protect a manned system as well. Uh, it's really just the best of, of both worlds. Um, and I think you always want to have that, that human uh, in the loop, uh, whether that human is on the ground or whether that human is in, in a cockpit. It's basically the, uh, a, a remote pilot that happens to be flying in formation with these unmanned systems. Yeah. Well, and I've read in many different places that uh, our military leaders and NATO in general are, are very cognizant of public worries about complete automation, right? And and so keeping humans in the loop, keeping humans in control is something that they are very well aware of. And from what I've read in numerous reports, that's something that there's a commitment to. One of the things that I've worried about, though, is Again, you'd mentioned automation as response to countermeasures. Um, in situations like the Ukraine war, if other nations pursue automation, do you think that that may end up forcing our hand and basically just forcing us towards complete automation, essentially just to keep up, I guess? <clears throat> yeah, so there's obviously there's different levels of uh, automation or autonomy, uh, and there's different portions of the mission where you can make things autonomous, right? We, we have a lot of autonomy built into systems now, uh, but what I think everyone is really concerned about is lethal autonomous weapon systems, right? Where a machine senses the environment, makes a positive identification of a target, makes the decision to strike that target, and then carries out that strike, right? So it, at some point in there, uh, currently, uh, the U.S. stance is at some point in there, uh, there will be human judgment, uh, meaningful human control, I believe is how the, the verbiage is, that there will be meaningful human control in these autonomous uh, systems. So at some point, a human has to say, yes, that is the absolute right target. Uh, perhaps it's when you positively identify the target, and then you could give the authority uh, to the system to carry out the strike. So I think the concern is, that we just take human judgment out of it completely, um, partially because we are unable to act or react uh, faster than our adversary. Right? So if, if our adversary can uh, outpace us, uh, if you're familiar with the OODA loop, the observe, orient, decide, and act, uh, the loop, uh, the decision cycle loop that was developed by you know, Colonel Boyd after observing you know, fighter aircraft in World War II, I'm sorry, in the Korean War. Um, basically, it's how you outpace your enemy and using tempo uh, as, as an advantage. Uh, 
right? So if, if your adversaries using a fully autonomous system and they can outpace you and make decisions and act faster and respond faster, is that going to force our hand to employ systems in kind? Um, I don't know. I, I, I'm very concerned about that. And I, I would like to think that we would always have uh, human judgment and, and a human in the loop. Uh, but what happens if our adversaries aren't uh, constrained to those same regulations? Do we then lose a tactical advantage and potentially uh, lose a conflict as a result? Uh, and if so, does that force our hand to, uh, to compete that we have to employ autonomous systems that are actually sensing the environment and making the determination to kill without human judgment. Uh, it's definitely something we should be uh, mindful of and watching and, and be concerned. Um, Absolutely. Well, so far we've framed this in terms of combat applications for drones. Um, but one of the other areas that comes to mind is full automation AI control for tasks like something like a C-130 transport plane. And for things like that, AI seems, it seems much more palatable, right? Uh, it, it's not directly putting anyone in danger. The only risk is error, you know, not, uh, you know, not error with weapon systems. And it seems like it could also allow uh, the military to reduce labor on tedious tasks as well as reallocate those personnel to more critical roles that require, you know, uh, human capabilities, right? Rather than simply babysitting something like a cargo plane, um, you know. So, it, like another thing that came to mind was, in a lot of these tedious roles, people have to work in shifts, right? So, not only like on that plane, not only would you have pilot, but you may potentially have more than one set. Of, of people doing the same task because they can't do it for 24 hours straight while it flies, you know, around the world. So. Yeah. I'm, the, the time and place that we choose to replace um, uh, humans with automation, uh, I think is, is important, right? I, I think for uh, dull, dirty, dangerous, um, you know, the kind of the three Ds. It, it makes sense to to automate to take the human out of there. Uh, in in uh, systems where it makes the most sense to have a human uh, at the edge, uh, making uh, judgment calls uh, in only the way that a human can uh, through context and, and sensing the things that, uh, that that humans do. Then it makes sense to you know to keep a human employed in that manner. Um, you know, your, your commercial airlines, the majority of the flight is automated, right? I mean, your, your pilots are there in case something goes wrong for takeoff and landings. Um, there's no reason why the majority of uh, those flights couldn't be completely automated. Uh, but that would scare us. I think if we, <laughs> if we got on a, uh, an airplane and we looked in the cockpit and there was nobody in there, um, you know, but uh, we're to the point where it's it's entirely possible for those kinds of flights to happen. Um, but there are a lot of situations uh, where the machine's capability exceeds a human's. Uh, like you talked about, long endurance, um, where you can have a long endurance, uh, you know, plane, uh, but you have to land and you know swap out crews because the crews need their rest. Right. If your cockpit is actually on the ground and it's flown remotely, you can hot seat the crew on the ground and keep the airplane up in the air. Uh, so, it's, you know, for aircraft that perform high G maneuvers, right, sometimes the limitation is is the, the G forces that the pilot can withstand. Right. It's not the, the airframe itself. So there, there are situations where it makes sense uh, because of the mission requirements to pull the human out. Uh, have them fly it remotely or have a lot of it uh, you know, done autonomously. Well, let me ask briefly about AI. And neither one of us is really an AI expert. So I guess we're just kind of prognosticating. But there has just been this explosion of new capabilities in the last year, right? I mean, it's all over the news. Chat GPT, uh, Google Bard, as well as computer art systems. And then, of course, there are te the Tesla self-driving systems, as well as other companies that, that continue to make progress. 
Um, I mean, these have gone from rudimentary work just a couple of years ago to outpacing humans in terms of quality, depending on the task. Do you see the the commercial sector enhancements affecting drones in the near future? Or do you think that that level of work is still a few years off? I think it's informing uh, the future. I think we're still in the period where we're looking at very narrow artificial intelligence. Uh, a lot of these AIs are are really good at a specific task, right? They can even the generative AI, like you can, you know, Chat GPT, you can you can have it write a a, a novel for you, or you can um, you can have uh, some AI create you know beautiful art for you, uh, but you can't have the art AI write a novel, or you can't have you know vice versa. So they're still very specific, very narrow, and what we what it would take for us to uh, completely replace a human is, you know, uh, artificial general intelligence, right? The, the, the thing that can replicate uh, everything that a human can do from thought to sensing to, you know, judgment to context, all of those. Uh, and and if, if you've ever uh, typed in anything in chat GPT and you've, you've asked it a kind of a, a, a wacky question, you know that it doesn't catch nuance and doesn't catch culture and context and and all of these things right and it'll respond with something like i'm you know, I'm, I, I'm unsure I'm, i i just don't know right so i i think we have uh, a long way to go um i think we're uh we're right to be excited about where we are with artificial intelligence uh but i i would really caution us to uh, not rush into it in situations that it's not mature enough to handle uh, particularly when it comes to some of the missions that we're doing in the military. Um, and that kind of gets back to the manned unmanned teaming, right? I think there's a lot of tedious tasks, as, as you've mentioned, that uh, the combination of autonomy, uh, artificial intelligence, robotics, you know, all of that together can, can perform some of that. But there's still going to be a place for a human. A conflict is, is a human endeavor, and, and it always should be. Wayne, that is that is a great note to close on. So let me thank you so much for your time today and again for your career of service. And let me close by asking, uh, what do you think the biggest issues are to focus on for the rest of 2023? And have you thought of, about writing more about this topic in the future? Yeah, I, I absolutely have. And, you know, I'm dabbling in fiction as well. So I'm, I'm thinking <laughs> in fiction, uh, fiction is interesting because it makes you think creatively about the future, about what's possible and how it will impact people, as opposed to my, you know, my first book where I kind of looked at the past and studied it. Uh, but now I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the future and I'm thinking about artificial intelligence and autonomy and where, uh, particularly drones and, and how does that impact humans in the future. So that's that's what I'm working on now. Well, thank you again for your time. And again, the book is On Killing Remotely by Wayne Phelps. I will put links in the show description, and it is a wonderful read. I have a copy of that, and it is absolutely worth reading to understand where all of this is going. So thank you again for your time today, sir. Thank you, Tim. It's always a pleasure.